If you would, take your Bibles with me and turn on over to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. As you're making your way there, you know, Exodus is such an intriguing book. It tells us so much about the nation of Israel and how they came to be. Here they were enslaved to Egypt. The Bible tells us for about 500 years they were enslaved to the Egyptians. They cried out for deliverance and in here the Lord sent Moses. Deliverance starts taking place. We have the ten plagues coming on Egypt. They see the mighty hand of God. They see the wonderful works He did. It's incredible. And then when the Pharaoh finally lets them go, they go off into the wilderness. They start heading out into their promised land where God has called them to be. But before they get there, the Lord has something He wants them to do. And that's where we start picking up in our story in Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. This is in verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Firoth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite of Baal Zephon. And you shall come before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the, say the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land, and the wilderness has closed in behind them. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh, over all his enemies, or over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now this is interesting because the stories that we we see on television, the replay of the Ten Commandments and all these things, they really don't present this this way. The Scripture says that Israel knew that where they were going, Pharaoh was going to find them, he was going to pursue them, and from what the description the Lord gave, that there would be no escape. It wasn't an accident that they ended up at the Red Sea. As a matter of fact, they knew where they were going. The Lord spoke to Moses, Moses told the people, we're going to go to a place We're going to be hemmed in by the desert. We're going to have the sea behind us. And Pharaoh is going to come and he's going to try to destroy us. That's what the Lord's saying. He said this is how it's going to happen. But he says, but the Lord promises in these verses that we just read, he said, I will have victory over Pharaoh. I'm going to show them that I am God. That's a scary thing, isn't it? I mean, you read that. We read the last part and we want to praise God and say, yes, absolutely, God's going to show Himself real. Well, let's look at the first few verses. I'm going to be trapped. I'm not so fond of that part. I'm going to be trapped. I'm not going to have any escape. They're going to have a bigger army. I'm going to have a smaller army. They're going to have weapons to kill me. I will have very few weapons to kill any of them. I don't like how this is shaping up. This is where I would say I'm starting to get a little nervous here. But see, it was never about the children of Israel as much as it was about God delivering Israel. Look at from the very beginning. From the very beginning when Moses went on Mount Sinai, God told, God told Moses, He said, I've seen the affliction that the Egyptians put on My people. I have heard their cry and I'm coming down to deliver them. That's what God told Moses on Mount Sinai. When Moses goes into Egypt, it's God who sends the ten plagues. Not Moses. It's God that sends the ten plagues into Egypt. It's God that continued to do the miracles that set the Israelites free. It's God that delivered them and led them through the wilderness. And now God says, I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to show myself real. And I'm going to destroy the Egyptians. But He's going to do it in His way. See, this is why we're children of faith. Because we have to trust that God's going to do it His way and that His way is better than mine. I have a certain way that I like to do it. I want to lay it out in a certain order. I, I want to, I, sometimes in my flesh, I want to look at God and say, no, Lord, I know You've got Your plan, but I think i got a pretty good one right here. I've got it all laid out. I've got it all laid out. I've got my blueprints. I've got everything laid out. I know exactly how this is going to work. And God looks at me like I'm a five-year-old boy and says, oh, that's great. Daddy will take care of it. Like, well, no, I have a good plan. It's a solid plan. I have it. I've thought it out. And God says, no, you're going to trap yourself in the desert and I'll be there and take care of you. It's all good. How is this good? This is not good. 
you look at this in, in the book of Exodus, and to every man's standard, it's not good. He even states in verse 3, Pharaoh's going to look at this and he's going to think, you guys are stupid. You are lost in the wilderness. You have hemmed yourselves in. You don't know what you're doing. You're bewildered. But God says in verse 4, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue you. And he says, I will gain, I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. He says, I'm going to do it. You're going to do this, and I'm going to deliver. See, that's what God does in our life time and time again. When we walk by faith, God says, I will deliver. I will be honored. You will see that it is me, and you will honor me. There's so many times in my life, and we see this so often, where God does something amazing, and yet we'll give praise to man, because we'll find some way in our flesh, we'll find some way to give credit to man. God's doing this in such a way where He says, I don't want anybody to get the credit that I deserve. I want to put you in such a position that you cannot fight this battle. You cannot get in my way. You cannot say that man has done it. You cannot say that you're a genius uh, as far as a general leading your men in the battle. I don't want anyone to get the credit. I want you to be back so much into a corner that when you see me work, you throw up your hands and say, boy, isn't God awesome. And he says, I'm going to do this, and when I'm done, your enemies will no longer be able to pursue you. You will not see anybody chasing you down in this new land I'm bringing you to. You will not have to look back and say, Pharaoh's going to find us. He says, I'm going to wipe them all out before you for my glory and my honor. He says, I'm going to do it. The, the Hebrews prayed for years, deliver us. When they left Egypt, they said, we're delivered. God looks at me and says, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. There's more I'm going to do. God looks at each and every one of us today and He says, all that I've done for you today, I'm not done yet. I've got more I'm going to do for you. You may feel backed in a corner. You may feel like everything's falling apart. But you walk by faith and God's going to look at you and say, I'm not done with you yet. Because the Scripture states that God's promises for you, they are good. They are to prosper you. They are to give you a future. They are to give you a hope. This is what God promises. He's not done yet. You may be like the children of Israel. You may feel as though God has put you in a no-win scenario, but He's done it for His glory. All He's asking for you and I today is to continue to have faith in Him and do what God has called us to do all along. As a matter of fact, when we continue in Scripture, hold your place here and Ephesians 4, or Exodus 14, we're coming back. But take your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 6. Go ahead and turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 6. If you do not know this chapter, I encourage you to get very familiar with it. There is so much here that we're not going to cover today, but it's important for your walk. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, this is the, the challenge that God gives to each and every one of us as believers. It says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is how this chapter starts and it plays right into what we were just reading in Exodus 14. He tells us first and foremost, be strong in the Lord. That's one of the biggest challenges the church fights today. One of the biggest challenges. We are not strong in our faith. We know a couple Bible verses. We know a couple here and there we're familiar with them and we want to say, I'm good. Do I drive my car when only two tires are in good shape? Do I drive my car when only one cylinder is firing properly? No. The whole car has to work or I don't trust it to get me there. As a Christian, how can I trust that I'm going to be strong enough if I'm not firing on all cylinders? It tells us right here in verse 1, it says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That means I need to dedicate myself to learning the promises of God. Learning the Scriptures of God. Learning the good things He has in store for me. I need to be building myself up a spiritual priesthood inside of myself that I can stand against those tricks of the devil. And they are tricks. They are absolutely tricks of the devil. You may say, Pastor, well, what are some tricks? I'll tell you right now. The devil will make things look good. He will make things look good. He will make rebellion taste sweet. He will make it look so good to get you away from God. 
Imagine what would have happened to Israel had they not obeyed the voice of God and gone where God told them to go. If that had happened, they may have never gotten out of Egypt. If that had happened, Pharaoh may have pursued them years later and it would have been far worse than what it is at this point. You see, for each and every one of us, God asks us, He says, I'm going to put you in some difficult situations for me to get the glory. But He doesn't want you to be afraid. He doesn't want fear to have the victory. He doesn't want you to be overcome. So He tells us right in here His, his Word. He says, be strong in me. Know the Word of God. Have a prayer life. Build up that person of faith. Be strong in the Lord. And know that in the power of His might, you're going to get the victory. Look at the next verse. Look at the very next verse here in Ephesians 6.2. He tells us, he says, he's, well not in verse 2, excuse me, but verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He doesn't say just put on part of it. He says put on all of it. Because the devil looks for a weak spot. He looks for it. He looks for the weak spot. I remember years ago when I used to think running wasn't a sin and I would play sports. I, I, I loved to play. That was a joke. Kind of a bad one, but it was a joke. But years ago when I played softball, I, I, used to, I used to always watch and see who the weak player was out in the field. I'm sure no one else ever did that. I'd watch to see where the weak player was and that's exactly where I was going to hit the ball. Because they're a weak player. I can hit the ball, I can get it right past them and I can get on base. What does Satan look for each and every one of us? The weak spot. He looks to see where he can hit you, where he can get you to doubt God. He looks to see where you're going to fall, most likely fall. And that's exactly where he aims for. And God knows this. And he tells us, I want you to be strong in me. I want you to be strong in faith. And I want you to put on the entire armor of God. I want you to put it all on. Because when that devil comes at you, it's going to be hard to stand. And I'm telling you what, it is hard to stand when He comes full force at you. Imagine back again in this story in the Exodus right here. You've got children with you. Sometimes we forget the dynamic. You had a whole nation of people. You have children. You have babies. You have wives. You have husbands. You have your whole family with you. And you see a man intent on killing you with over 600 chariots coming right down on you and you have no escape. That is a test of faith that I hope I never have to endure. That's a hard one. And God says, I know it's going to be hard. That's why you need to be putting on the whole armor of God as Christians. God will keep His Word. God will keep His promise. But why do we make ourselves suffer with fear and doubt when God tells us that we can arm ourselves up so it doesn't overwhelm us? He says, put on the whole armor of God. So that when the test comes, you'll be able to stand. Go back to Exodus 14 for a minute. I want to take you on over to verse 10. Because this is important. When you're looking at these verses, we're seeing real people. And how real people handle these terrible situations. Exodus 14, verse 10. It says, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt so with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is it not, is it not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians and that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Then the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. First of all, I want to point out that what God told Moses back in the beginning of the chapter is the very same thing that's happening right now. God told him, you're going to go to this place and Pharaoh is going to come down on you. Moses went, went to this place. Pharaoh did exactly what God said he would do. He came down on him. The mere fact that they are in this is evidence that God is in control because God said it was going to happen. Now Moses 
He's telling the people, he's looking at the, at the Lord, he's saying, trust in the Lord, he's going to deliver us. But look who the people are looking to. They're not calling out to God. They're not saying, God, why did you bring us out here? They're looking at Moses. This is what happens. When you get your eyes on man, fear starts to take over. Fear starts to take over and consume. And when fear starts consuming you, all of a sudden you start lashing out at everybody and everything until there is nothing left. It's a wild animal is exactly what it is. You ever trap a wild animal before? Whoo! I have. You talk about a wild ride. That thing's biting at everything, including itself. It has no idea what's going on. All it knows is it wants out. And now you're looking at the Israelites. What are they doing? They're like wild animals. They are lashing out at everybody and everything, but they never look up at God. They never look to God. You can read these verses a thousand times over. You will not see one place right here in these few verses we read where the Israelites turned to God when Pharaoh was bearing down on them. Not one time. Every one of them turned to man. Every one of them turned to Moses. This is part of our problem. We want to put our trust in a man rather than put our trust in God. We would rather trust in man's ability rather than put on the armor of God. We would rather lean on somebody else's faith than try to build up our own faith. God says, no, 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 no. My relationship with you is personal. If you want to be able to stand, you've got to build up a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want to see God move in your life, you've got to make God a priority in your life. You can't lean on the coattails of someone else. You can't look at the pastor and say, that's your job. My job is to share the truth with you. Your job is to take that truth and do something with it. Build a home that's going to last in the storm. When you read these Scriptures, it is evidence of how important it is to have a relationship with God Almighty. Because Moses, when all this is happening, and he's target numero uno, you better believe Pharaoh, when he's looking for him, he's looking for Moses. And Moses is the only one that just says, stand still. Don't try to run away. God already said this was going to happen. Stand still and see the salvation of God. God didn't tell Moses He was going to do anything yet. All He said was that the Israelites were going to get the victory. And to Moses, that was enough. He says, I'll stand here and I'll watch. He had a relationship with God. Church, with everything our country and our, and our families go through today, if you don't have a relationship with God, you're in for a wild ride that you're not going to like very much. You have to have a relationship with God. A personal one. You can't lean on the church and say, you carry my faith for me. It doesn't work that way. You can't lean on a pastor or a parent. It's about your faith in God. And when you read this example, when you read this story, it is an example of exactly that. God had shown Himself faithful so many times up to this point. He would given the Israelites so many different signs to show that He is God. He has showed them over ten times the plagues that came over Egypt. They could rest in Goshen. Not one plague hit Goshen where the Israelites rested. They all went on over to Egypt. Every single one of them. And they watched as God poured out His wrath until they were delivered after 500 years of slavery. God showed that He was faithful. And now here, they are hemmed in. There's nowhere to go. God has told them already before this happened. He said, you're going to be in an impossible situation, but don't worry. I've got this under control. And fear came in like a flood, and they started crying out, lashing out at Moses, saying, we should have been left as slaves. We should have never been given the victory. You should have never brought us out here. Notice how fear was so quick to give up the victory they had already been given. Just the other day, my wife and I, we took, we took the kids up to the state fair. We went to Indy. And while we were up there, Miranda looked at me. She goes, let's, let's go by our house where we lived in Indy. Let, let's let's go, go by it and see it. So we did. We lived in a very high crime area. We lived in a, a very poor area right, right by 465. And we went by there and we drove by the house. And I stopped for a minute. I looked. And I smiled and I looked at Miranda. I said, it's so easy to forget what all God has done, isn't it? 
I said it's so easy to forget. We get caught up in so many things about life. We get caught up on so many day-to-day trials and adversities. It's easy to forget how far God really brings us. It's incredible when you look back, isn't it? Each one of us can look back at really low points of our life. And when you do, you're going to start asking the question, how did I get from over here to over here? It happens and you don't even realize it's happening. God just blesses and He just pours it out and He says, look at what I can do. And to Israel, if they stopped for a moment, they could look back and say, my my father's generation, my grandfather's generation never knew freedom. And here we are today. But yet, in this moment, and it's so human, it's, it's such human nature, in this moment, they look at Pharaoh and they say, we're willing to go back into slavery. So easy to forget. Easy to forget how they got their freedom and how easy it is to forget how precious it really is. We just let it all go by. And yet God in the meantime is looking right at us and He says, I've got more for you. I've got more for you. He says, I didn't want to just bring you out of Egypt. I want to destroy your enemies so you never have to worry again. And I want to give you a memorial to give to your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren of how great God is. Look at what God does in this story. He did something that now, four or five thousand years ago, we still talk about it today. And we still say today, look what God can do. But boy, it was hard for the people going through it. It was hard going through it, but it produced something so incredible. We go on through and we continue to look at this in 1 Peter. Go ahead and turn there. You don't need to hold your place, but go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. It's incredible what God does. Just incredible. 1 Peter chapter 5 starting in verse 6. It says, Therefore humble yourselves under the hand of, and the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Let's pause right there for a moment. God says be humble under the mighty hand of God, because why? He cares for you. He cares for you. He doesn't overlook you. He's not ignoring you. He's not looking past you. He's looking at you. He says, I care for you. Oh my goodness. There by the Red Sea, the mama's crying for their babies. Their baby's crying for their moms and their dads. Mom thinking that dad's going to die in war and that there's no future for their kids. And God says, I see you. And what I do today is to secure a future for you. Trust me. I've got this thing covered. And God parts the Red Sea. He says, that's the God you serve. That's the future I have for you. And He tells me in the New Testament, He's speaking directly to me. He says, humble yourself under My mighty hand because I care for you. Oh my goodness, He cares for you. You say, Pastor, if He cares for me, Why do I go through the things I go through? Why do I have the struggles that I have? You know, God never told us life would be easy. God never told us that life would be fair. God never told me that there wouldn't be tears that I cry. He never told me that there wouldn't be times where I'd get frustrated and angry. He told me He cares for me. My dad has done the same thing for me and so has my mom all my life. When I was a child and I did something wrong, I got punished. But I still knew dad cares for me. When dad had to tell me no when there was something I wanted, I still knew my mom and my dad, they care for me. When my mom couldn't do what everybody else was doing for their families but trying to feed me, I knew my mom still cared for me. Life wasn't always easy. Life wasn't always pretty. But I knew they always cared for me. And they got me to where I am today. 
God cares for you. As a loving parent loves their children, so God also cares for you. And your life isn't always going to be easy. It's not going to always be a bed of roses. You're not going to always get what you want. But you will always be given enough. God will always bring you to something else. He will always bring you to something new and something better in time if you trust Him. And that's how these Scriptures start right here. It's God telling us that if we submit to God, if we rest in Him, if we live for Him, if I make Him a priority, there are better things waiting for me as I go forward. There's something better waiting as I go forward. Church, sometimes we suffer not because God wants us to suffer, but because I refuse to submit. I refuse to submit and humble myself under God's mighty hand. And that's the first thing the Scripture says. That's the first thing God tried to teach Israel. You have to submit to God. I have talked to so many people over so many things. And we rob ourselves of so many blessings. Because we ignore one area of Scripture. We ignore it. We just pitch it. And we say, I'm not going to do that. And then we come back later and say, why doesn't God bless me? It might have something to do with the fact that you're ignoring what God said to do. And I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm saying when you don't obey God, don't expect the blessings of God to follow. Don't expect it. You say, that's not fair. How can you say God's loving? Well, it's quite simple. When I disobeyed my dad, he didn't give me what I wanted. No! My dad warmed me up. I know that's not politically correct anymore, but buddy, he did. He warmed me up. I think the world would be a better place if that happened a little more. And my dad would tell me, he said, son, I love you, but you can't do this. I don't think God tells us anything different, do you? I think when I get out of line with God, he gets on me. He warms me up and he says, you can't do this. I've made you for something better. Israel found this out time and time and time again. God was always there to punish, but God was always there ready to forgive if Israel called out. But Israel did not get the blessing until they started being submissive under the mighty hand of God. And you look here in the Scripture and it tells us, it tells you and me the same thing. We have to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and He will exalt us He will bless us in due time because He cares for us. Look at verse 8. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us by His eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I remember my wife and I, when we finally were able to move out of our house in Indy, we found a little house in the country. And boy, it looked good. It it, it looked great. Bought it as is, beautiful little home. And it wasn't until we lived there for a little while we found out nothing worked. Nothing worked. I remember I was back, I was back in the living room. Miranda was in the kitchen. She was running the water. And she heard the water pouring out. And she, she looked at me. She said, it's dumping out somewhere. I said, I don't see where. I said, I'm looking under the sink. I don't see it anywhere. There's no water on the floor. I'm looking all around the counters. It's dry. I don't see any water. And then I walked into the laundry room. That's where the water was going. It was all dumping out in the laundry room. So I open it up. Pipes all stopped up, full of junk. And I thought, man, that's not good. And I went and I got an auger and I'm trying to auger it out. It won't come out. That thing's packed in there like cement. I actually got the auger stuck. I had trouble getting the auger out thought that's not going to work so I went to the store I went to the store and I bought this stuff it was like an acid that you can pour in there and eat it out and I thought that'll work so I put it on down in there and I waited a while didn't do anything I thought boy that's no good put a little more in there it's not good I looked at the back said don't exceed more than four teaspoons I just put four in there it didn't make a dent 
And it went down in the concrete. I thought, I'm not going to jackhammer up the floor. That's going to be a mess. So I thought, what am I going to do? I looked at Marina. I said, hey, honey. I said, say a prayer for me. She goes, what are you going to do? I dumped half the bottle down in there. I was like, well, forget this. I dumped half the thing down in there. That thing smoked like sin. It filled up the whole house. Oh, it reeked. Cleaned out the pipe. I don't think it existed anymore. I think it was just molded down in there. After the pipe was fixed, and I thought, okay, that's good. Started having an electricity issue. Had to rewire the whole house. Took me six months. We brought, wired that thing top to bottom. Duck work was no good. Had to do that. I told everyone that house, I spent more time over it or under it than I did in it. it, it I, everything had to be done. And I get down there, spend eight hours under the house trying to run duck work and do everything. And I think, Lord, what are you doing to me? You brought me out here. You got me out of the city. And all I have is trouble. What are you doing? He tells me, he says, submit to me in due time. I will exalt you. I'm down there under the house with the spiders and the snakes. I'm saying, Lord, could your clock just speed up just a little bit? I mean, I'm doing my part. Just speed it up just a little bit. Get going. My wife and I, we were looking to move at one point. We wanted, we wanted to really get going. We wanted God to, to really move. And we're, we're looking for another house by this point. We looked for over a year. Could not find anything. God just wasn't in it. We couldn't find a thing. We're both frustrated saying, God, why? God, why? We're obeying You. We're trusting You. God, why isn't this working? Scripture comes back to mind. We keep going. More problems arise at the house. I'm fixing more problems. And God in all this was doing something. I didn't know what he was doing, but he was doing something, and I trusted him, and I knew it. You see, when you look at these verses right here, it never says, not one time does it say that things are going to be easy. But it tells me, especially in verse 8, he says, I want you to be sober. I want your mind to be on Scripture. I want you to be vigilant, because discouragement, the devil, the things of the devil, they're walking about like a roaring lion, seeking who they're going to devour. I have all these opportunities to let anything and everything get my eyes off of Christ. And I've got to be vigilant to keep them on Him. In all this, God was preparing a way for us to come here. I didn't know it. I was looking to stay up there. I had no intention of moving. But God was looking to bring us here. I had no idea what was going on. And I was getting mad and I was getting discouraged. But I had to keep trusting God. I, I know Him. And that's something I kept saying to myself. I know Him. I know Him. I know His plans are good. I know He is just. I know He is loving. I have no idea why anything is, why everything is going wrong. I have no idea why all my plumbing is going bad. Why my electricity is going bad. I have no idea why I have all this work coming out my ears and the problems I have at church. I have no idea why I'm going through all this. But Lord, I know You. I trust You. I'm going to go forward. And then eventually there came a time where we were able to come here. God opened that door. Nobody opened it. I didn't open it. God just dropped it in our lap. And I kid you not, no more than God dropped it in our lap, we found a house within one week of coming down here. And about one week after looking for over a year up north, we found one within a week here. And God just boom, 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 just started dropping everything in our lap. And that's where you start looking at Scripture. You say, God, I'm starting to get it now. I'm starting to understand. It's about you putting things in order. Not me putting things in order, but it's about you putting things in order so that you get the praise, so you get the glory, so you get the fame. God, it's about you doing it and not me doing it. God, you have a plan and I trust you today. I trust you today. I know the devil's walking around trying to destroy me. I know the devil's trying to discourage me. I know he's trying to get my eyes off of you. But God, I trust you today. Like the children in the wilderness saying, God, you promised me a homeland. And here I am. I'm hemmed in and I have nowhere to go. I have no money to pay my bills. I have no home to live in. God, my family's a wreck. My marriage is a wreck. I'm boxed in. What do you want from me? 
And God says, I want you to be still. Submit under my hand. And see what I can do. And God parts the waters. One of the biggest fights we have as believers today is trusting in God's timing and not our own. If I had it my way, things would be a lot different. But it was never about me. Never about me. It's about Him. The Exodus may be written about the Hebrews, but God is the star of the story. God's the one that always proved faithful. Not Israel. God was the one that always proved faithful. We see Moses, a man of God, how he was able to stand when no one else was able to stand because he learned to trust God. And that's the challenge for the Israelites, and that's your challenge, your challenge and my challenge today. Trust Him when there's no reason to trust Him. Just sit back and say, I know who He is. It's going to be okay. That's our promise, church. That's our promise. As the music comes forward and we prepare for our altar call, over the years... I've seen God's Word tested and tried more times than I could possibly count. And every time it has been proven true. Every time. People will ask you every once in a while, they'll tell you, say, give me some evidence. Show me. And I could point to a lot of different things. I could give you a lot to try to show you how God is true and faithful. But I doubt that's going to help you much. Because, see, it all comes down to your story. It comes down to you. Are you going to trust God with what you're going through right now? Are you going to trust Him? You can read about how other people trusted God, and you can learn from their faithfulness, but are you going to trust Him? When each of us go home today, we go home to different challenges. Every one of us. Your challenges could be anything. They could have to do with health, maybe a bad prognosis. It could be unruly children or problems in the home. It could be marriage. It could be bills. It could be anything. Something I didn't even mention. It could be anything. And the question that remains is, are you going to trust in the Lord? Are you going to give it to Him today and walk in victory? Nobody can make that decision for you. Nobody can force your hand and say, you're going to do this. That's your choice. That's a loving God letting you make that choice. And I can promise you today, though it may not be easy, I can promise you that God will always be faithful. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And all the things my wife and I have been through, and we've been through some real trials, God has never once failed us in any way, shape, or form. He's not shown up exactly when we thought He should, but His timing has always been perfect. And it will never change. God wants to do the same and more for each and every one of you here. The Bible describes you as a Christian believer. You are a chosen generation, a holy people, a holy nation set apart for His own good works. That's what God thinks of you today. That's what God thinks of you. You may sit back and you may make the argument, Pastor, you don't know me. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know the things I've said. You don't even know what I'm thinking right now. I don't. I don't need to. I have no need to know any of those things. What I know is that God made you. When you were still in your mother's womb, God formed you with His own hands. And He formed you with a purpose. And He formed you with a plan. And it's a good plan according to Scripture. Nothing you've done has changed that. 
nothing. If it had, you would not be here today. The only question that remains is, will you accept the gift of God Almighty and the plan that He has for your life? Granted, you may feel like the Israelites. There have been many times I've felt just like them. And I want to look up at God and say, God, why? Why? But in the end, God always looks at me and says the same thing every time. Do you trust me? Let me ask you, do you trust him? You won't be disappointed. Whatever needs you have, whatever prayer you need to pray, for anything God has laid on your heart, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior, and you want to ask him to come into your heart today, you can do that. If you're someone you just want to be sure, you just want to know with certainty where you stand with God, then this altar is open for you. For any prayer you need to pray for, any need you have, I invite you this morning, this altar is open.